of congenital diaphragmatic hernia is between 1, to one, one in 2,000 to 1 in 3,000 and term de deliveries throughout the world actually. The variation is not that much there. So we do see a lot of congenital diaphragmatic hernias. The ma two major problems with the congenital diaphragmatic hernia for cause of mortality and morbidity is a pulmonary hyperplasia, which is almost always present. The degree varies with the degree of how, many, the, how much intestines are in the chest and the, uh, all of the factors there. The second thing is the pulmonary hypertension there. So yesterday we talked about the neonate with the pulmonary hypertension and the ECMO. The most of those time when we talk about is a reactive pulmonary hypertension there. There, the management of pulmonary hypertension is a crucial to outcome of the child, okay? So that means you, can't, you, you have to avoid hypercapnia, acidosis, maintain the uh, effective volume in a sense of FRC, Whereas here, most of the pulmonary hypertension is fixed because of structural disease. Though there may be some amount of reactivity is there, so here, trying to maintain the, along with the pulmonary hyperplasia, if you try to maintain the normal CO2, you end up causing actually a lot of damage there. So goals of therapy for these patients are optimization of oxygenation, ventilation, and then perfusion, same thing, while avoiding barotrauma. You know, we talk about always avoid barotrauma in all critically ill patients. But here it really means a lot because, and here it starts from the a minute of birth. This is what I'm going to uh, actually talk about that. So if you are going to manage uh, CDH, okay, and then you know already uh, the diagnosis antenatally. First thing is try not to bag when, when the child is born. Try to intubate without bagging. That's probably number one there. After intubation, or even before intubation, if you have to bag, Try to keep your PIP less than 25 and place an NG tube immediately after birth. So this is what we're trying not to inflate lungs too much. I think that this is probably the most important aspect of it is the large centers where they're inborn versus outborn unit, the C CDH outcomes are very different. Those comes from outside just because of the resuscitation was done uh, outside with the reduce or high pressures there. Um, and then most of the neonatal bagging, there is a PIP pop of valve, okay? Normally when I say in the pediatric ICU, watch that and uh, keep that PIP valve on so that uh, it can generate high pressures so that the poorly compliant lung can be inflated during resuscitation. But here, just make sure that that valve is off. That means it is not, the PIP pressures do not go, does not go more than 25. Most of those bags have a, a set at about 25. So that's the important point there. So. Ventilator strategy, uh, you keep the rate around 20 to 60. PIP, not more than 25. That's probably number one there. PEEP, adequate up to five. Again, high PEEPs are not needed. Little, because lungs are hypovolemic uh, anyway, you don't need to try, try to open up until the FRC as we see in a normal lungs there. IT time, maximum to 0.6. And FIO to titrate to keep, if, we, if, you can, if you can get a saturation of about 90%, uh, titrate up to keeping a 90% saturation. So your goals of uh, the management is pre-ductal saturation. Here, you don't even look at the post-ductal saturation. If the pulmonary hypertension is there, you're going to have a shunt and your post-ductal saturation could be pretty low. So pre-ductal saturation, you, can, you may have to accept as, lo as low as 80, as long as there is an adequate perfusion. I told you yesterday, it is not the low saturation kills the patient, it's the low perfusion kills the patient there. You know, it's all about a perfusion really. So Try to keep the pH 7.25 and above, and a CO2 up to 65. Whereas a PPHN, you want to keep a normal CO2. Here, we don't need to shoot for it. If you get a normal CO2 with a, this sort of ventilator, that's a good thing. If you can't, then you just accept up to 65. And a blood pressure adequate for the age. And there, are, there is a data about the uh, avoiding bicarbonate and avoiding paralysis. Now, yesterday, again, we talked about the meconium aspiration, PPHN, and then para paralyzing, and some of the neurotologists say that, why paralysis? Here, they have shown that paralysis actually causes a problem. Because what happens is you end up using higher pressures. We lose the spontaneous breaths of the baby, the interaction, and then we can cause more problem there. So trying to avoid paralysis is probably the better thing here. So when do you get a uh, high frequency? If we can't manage with a PIP of 25, then you have to go on a high frequency. 
one crucial thing about the converting from the conventional to the high frequency. Normally in a pediatric patients or even neonates, when you do it, you increase your mean airway pressure by about five to six. So if suppose on conventional it is about 12, you, you starting mean airway pressure on a, a high frequency is usually about uh, 15 to 16 or something like that, or something like that, 16 to 17, something like that. But here, don't increase your mean area pressure. Just leave the same as start with your starting mean area pressure on a high frequency should be the same as what was the on your conventional uh, mean area pressure. Second thing is again not more than 17 because again, high inflation can cause more problem there. So initially the initial studies show that the high frequency didn't make a lot of difference. Looks like some retrospective data there may be some improvement in survival with the use of uh, high frequency ventilation. Nitric oxide. Again, there is no clear data that nitric oxide improves survival. It's easiest to institute. It does improve your pulmonary uh, vascular resistance if it is reactive. So it is worth trying. Almost all patients who fail the conventional ventilation, they go on nitric oxide. It's unusual not to give nitric oxide in these patients there because it's readily available and easy to institute there. And then acute toxicity is really not much there. So there is an increase in use for sure, and there is also a decrease in ECMO uh, usage last over 10 years, just either it's because of nitric oxide or because of many other things, we don't know, but there is some association there. Um, most centers use for pulmonary hypertension. Short term for a pre-op, and then sometimes a low dose, long term uses are being used. Okay, after surgery is done, they still have a lot of pulmonary hypertension, low dose. Nowadays, more many people are converting it to seldom have health. Surfactant, no, no. This is one place surfactant has shown to actually not improve and it in fact causes more problem there. So this is definitely the data there and that there's no need of doing surfactant in this patient. Now ECMO. There are no randomized trials to show that ECMO improves outcome on a CDS there. You know, it's really, this is the one place when to use it's uh, confusing. It depends upon who you ask. They will tell you different stories. So there is some data that early stabilization Delayed repeat and ECMO improves uh, survival in high risk CDH. So there is definite role there, but when is really about experience and the individual institutions preferences are there. I'll show you some of the data there. So this is called a, uh, uh, that's old that's exactly that's all there. Now this is the um, uh, Dr. Tyagaraj um, is here from the tail of two cities. This is a really good study of, uh, <laughs> looking at the Toronto and Boston. Both are outbound pediatric children's hospital, large centers, huge referral. Um, there is same similar number of CDH patients, okay? And then the same duration of CDH outcomes they are looking at it, okay? Independently, people are different. They have done their own, everybody has done them. They just looked at it. So what happened is ECMO use in Boston was 50% of CDH patients, and then ECMO use of 1% in Toronto, okay? That's all, the CDH patients, okay? And then survival, 53 in Boston, 55% in Toronto. So you can now understand what is the role of ECMO in these patients there. So it's almost same outcomes, same story, same, uh, everything, whole profile is almost same. It's like you couldn't have done a, a better randomized trial th than this one, okay? So I think the, there is a role of ECMO, but we have to really know when to do it. Mm -hmm.